work session of the City of Falls Church City Council. Uh, we've got an agenda. The first item on the agenda is the library comprehensive plan, but before we start that, we have some citizen activists here who are on the library board, and I want to express my appreciation for being here and our librarian, of course. So thank you all uh, very much for, for being here and all the work that you put in on behalf of the citizens uh, uh, each and every day that you serve on that board. Thank you. Uh, Wyatt? Thank you, Vice, Vice Mayor Snyder and members of council. If we could have uh, our library director, Mary McMahon, and uh, the team that is going to present tonight to come forward here to the table. <coughs> tonight we're uh, going to give the council a briefing on the status of our master plan and space needs study review. and. Um, uh, we don't have a decision request f uh, for council tonight. Instead, what the, what the team is looking for is feedback from council on the general direction of the plan um, so that we can really just check in uh, with the council on that direction. And then lastly, um, once you see what that general direction is, um, there is some outreach to adjacent properties that would be the natural next step as part of our due diligence process in terms of that direction and so we would want to get some council discussion and feedback as to whether the timing is right to begin that outreach. But um, Ms. McMahon, if you could introduce our team and then uh, make the presentation. Certainly. If you see the green light, it's on. And just so everyone's aware, the purpose of the microphones is for the cable television for the, the folks walk, um, watching at home as well as in the room. Tonight I'd like to, first of all, thank you for allowing us to be here, and secondly, to introduce uh, David Moore, who is the architect uh, for the team, uh, Dick Waters, who is the library consultant for the team, Pamela Gillen, who is also another um, architect for the team, and then, of course, you know Brad Grenan, who is the president of the library board. Um, we're here tonight to tell you a little bit about how far along the um, team is in terms of the project. Um, that is part of the RFP uh, requirements for them to give you an update and to also solicit input from you. Um, I will say that um, we've had a number of public meetings. We had an online uh, survey as well as an in-house survey soliciting information from not only your, yourselves but also from the public and um, that is helping drive a lot of what we're doing here tonight. Um, I will mention that we have looked at a lot of different options in terms of sites but um, it was the overwhelming um, opinion of everyone that we spoke with that it remain on the site that it currently is located. Um, because it's centrally located, it's walkable uh, from a majority of the city. Um, there's a great synergy between the city um, hall and the library and the park. Um, the available, an available, an additional available location is not necessarily available. <laughs> we don't know when that could possibly be. It's uncertain. Um, as you know, there is a covenant on the land, uh, which, if it's not used for a public library, reverts back to the family. Um, the schools are too far away in terms of locating uh, a, a campus-type facility. And um, they also indicated to us that they were not interested in us being with them. And finally, uh, the patrons that were surveyed, as I mentioned, made it very clear that they wanted it to remain where it's currently located. Um, also tonight, there will be a brief discussion about parking. Um, while that is not necessarily in the scope of work of the RFP, it is highly recognized that if we're going to increase the size of the building, if that's what it's called for, and it is, um, that parking should be a part of that um, whole process. And so the consulting team has pulled together some ideas which are in your packet and we could talk briefly about those as well tonight. So um, 
while the consultants have several options to present to you tonight, um, they're really looking for in, um, input from you all uh, about concerns, um, but they also have some very definite ideas about which way we should go. So I'll turn it over to David Moore, who is the architect. Thank you and good evening, everybody. Uh, let me first, on behalf of the team, Dick and Pamela and myself, uh, thank you all uh, in your community for giving us the opportunity to work with you and to really be involved in a great library here in Falls Church, Virginia. It's been a rewarding process so far, and uh, it's really been a, a thrill for us to get to know your community and, and so many of you as individuals in the process. Um, as Mary said, we're really here to, to, to solicit your comments, answer questions, uh, and, 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 and hopefully get feedback on uh, some of the things we're going to present with you tonight. As many of you know, in June, we were here for several days, about a week, and we met with many of you. We met with uh, citizens at community meetings. We met with city uh, staff and departments, and we really met with anyone who was willing to listen to us to try to glean information about the library and how it's perceived in the community and, um, and how the library could be better. We asked how it could be better, what could we do differently, and all those things. And really, the first five pages in this report, I won't read everything to you, but um, this is really a collection of a lot of the information that we gleaned through those meetings as well as through the surveys that Mary mentioned, the online surveys and the paper surveys uh, in the library that were handed out. Uh, I think the basic conclusion of those first five pages is that you have a highly valued, uh, highly loved, and a very uh, popular library. I mean, people love your library, and it uh, really enjoys a high esteem in the community, uh, more so than most that, that I think that, that, that I've encountered. Um, and as Mary said, they really love the location, and that's a specific question we asked them, and they were very uh, forthright in saying they loved where it was. And, um, and so um, in light of that and in keeping with the RFP, we have analyzed how the library can address needs projecting out for the next 20 years uh, and to do so uh, in that site, and we're going to talk about some of those recommendations for you. Now, based on the current usage patterns, um, we have projected the library's usage needs for the next 20 years, and uh, Dick Waters has been uh, played an integral role in doing that. And in doing that, what we've concluded as a team is that the library needs to grow from the 18,500 square feet that you have now to a total of about 33, 33,000 square feet. Um, essentially, the library needs to grow about 14,500 square feet larger. Uh, which would be the equivalent of about a floor and a half of your existing building. So, uh, pages six and seven of your handout is just a diagram showing how the growth in each of the different departments, the net growth, would look if you laid the amount of space that needs to be in each department over where that department is now. And you can see uh, by the diagrams that essentially every department needs to grow. And so that's the challenge as we begin to look at options and strategies for how to meet that need of 14,500 square feet is how do we provide a way to accommodate that in all the departments because you can see every department needs to grow substantially. So we've come up with a couple strategies on how that can happen and we essentially looked at three approaches. Uh, the first approach is not really documented. Page 8 is the uh, some still images of a computer model that we've begun to construct of the library site and, this, and, the, and the immediate block and, um, and it reflects contours and, 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 and streets and sidewalks and all those physical um, um, elements. The first option that we looked at and talked about and considered is the option of, of literally raising the building, tearing it down, and building a new one in its current location. And very quickly, we deemed that maybe not as viable as some of the other options. Obviously, the, the economic impact you can imagine of tearing down a viable building in so many ways and rebuilding it in the same location um, could become expensive. But I think primarily one of the things that would be really be a problem would be the, where does the library go for the year, the 18 months that that would take place. And so I think that was a real problem. Um, and so the next option, if you look on page uh, 9, uh, was to if explore, and we were asked to do this specifically in the RFP, explore the viability of taking the roof off the building and adding a third floor. And we have had a structural engineering analysis done of the building. Um, and, and if you remember, I mentioned that actually 
if we were to do that, it would not give us enough square footage that you need anyways. But even if we could do it, um, the building would not uh, be large enough. But what we found through the structural analysis, as you can imagine, is that the building would require an enormous amount of work to bring the building up to the current seismic codes. It also, practically speaking, requires you to move out of the building for that same 12 to 18 months during the construction because you're essentially ripping the roof off the building and exposing the building to the outside elements as if it were a raw construction site. So again, we did not deem that to be a very uh, viable a solution and strategy for expanding your building. And you'll see on these pages, there are some pros and cons we've enumerated for each of these options. If you look on page 10, you'll see uh, the third option. It's called option two, but uh, maybe reordered in my verbal presentation. Really what I'm considering the third option is some form of horizontal expansion. And in this particular image, we've shown expansion on three sides of the library. I'll point out to you, we have not shown expansion to the bottom of the library as you look at this sheet between uh, this building and the, what is it, the CSI building right below the library, primarily because the existing drawings that we've been provided by the city indicate that there is a, a storm sewer easement along that side of the building. So in light of that, um, the building cannot be expanded in that direction. So this, this diagram shows and illustrates just this idea that we could maybe expand the building on the other three sides and pick up the required 14,500 square feet on all three sides over two floors. And of course, one of the pros with this is that the library could remain in operation in its location. Of course, the construction would have to be phased, and there would be some, obviously, disruption and noise and things like that. But uh, uh, considering the alternative of having to move out, this seems to be a very viable option. And then in page 11 and 12, we just began to uh, explore what that might look like in terms of a floor plan. This is really an internal planning document that we're discussing with the library and the staff to understand how that program for the increased library would fit into that building. What would we do around existing walls and columns and elevators and restrooms? And Mary and her staff were looking at that and giving us feedback. So this plan that you see is really a draft. and. Um, and the final report will have some iteration of that, but not that exact drawing. Page 13, you'll see another option of a horizontal expansion that instead of wrapping the building on three sides, shows uh, a considerable addition to one side, um, actually two sides, but the majority of the expansion to one side. In this diagram, it actually shows the expansion going beyond the uh, boundary of the existing library property, which presents different pros and cons, as you can imagine. And again, uh, 14 and 15 show diagrammatic floor plans of how the interior of that library of that design might be configured and um, and we are I'll tell you we are continuing to explore as, as a result of conversations uh, presented to the board we're presenting uh, actually exploring uh, one or two other horizontal expansion scenarios to try to come up with the most efficient economical and uh, functional library plan that we can now in terms of the parking analysis, um, on page 16, let me say, if you look at the diagram, you'll see the dash yellow line on the plan. That is the uh, location of that storm sewer easement. So that is what we're assuming we cannot grow into the direction of the dash yellow line. Uh, the other thing I'll point out is that within the white area, the adjacent property, as we counted, um, not 100% sure that's accurate, but we believe there's 108 parking spaces. Uh, there and that number will come into play in some of the analysis and as Mary mentioned this is really not with necessarily within the scope of the RFP but we felt like just as we began to explore how the building might grow we should look at the parking solution hand in hand I will say that many of the comments we heard in the public forums was uh, a, a really a cry from the public to address the parking issue at the library so we felt like we would just take a little diversion and throw out a few ideas um, let me revise uh, for you some of the numbers at the top of the page verbally. Um, your zoning ordinance would require 400, one parking space for 400 square feet of the library. So if we took the, the, the built out library of 33,000 square feet, you would need approximately 83 spaces. And then typically what we would do in libraries, because uh, these libraries and this one, our program is recommending that you have a meeting room component that we would, if, if that meeting room, say, were to hold 100 people, uh, at a minimum, we would recommend that you have at least 50 parking spaces, so assuming two people per car. Uh, there are many occasions when that library meeting room might be used uh, in addition to the normal usage of the library. So with that said, we're looking at about 100 
33, say round numbers, 130 parking spaces at a minimum to serve a library of this size uh, in compliance with your zoning ordinance and with libraries that we see across the country. So um, what we've done in trying to analyze how that might happen, if you look at page 17, this is a diagram of, of an elevated deck that, that could possibly be built on the adjacent property. And of course, you can see with the math, it displaces the 108 spaces essentially that are on grade. Um, but this level of this garage could create uh, uh, an additional 200 spaces, which of course is more than the 130 that we would recommend that you have. But we just wanted you to see what 200 spaces in this adjacent area could look like on the plan. And certainly we can entertain any questions you might have on that. And then finally, if you look on page 18, this is another scenario um, where 200 parking spaces could actually be situated in the in a uh, elevated deck between the library and the neighboring building. It would preserve a great portion of the existing spaces on that property. And again, uh, pretty e this, this design actually works with the grade of the site and could be an efficient way to pick up spaces uh, that could serve the library and, and, and maybe other neighboring properties. So with that, I'll conclude my presentation. And uh, Dick and Pamela and I and Mary and Brad are uh, certainly glad to entertain any questions that you may have. Thank you uh, very much. Let me ask any members of the library board if you'd like to say anything at this point. Please feel free. The only thing I might add would be we had tried to approach this from sort of a neutral objective, which was not necessarily expansion at all, because as you've probably heard or read, a lot of people out there believe that in 20 to 30 years there won't be public libraries, and then another subset of people believe if there are public libraries, they won't have books in them, and they can be smaller than today. So the board was interested in figuring out whether, with their assistance, whether that applied to Falls Church. Would we be comfortable in the existing building? perhaps because it might have a lot fewer books. What the consultants have told us is that is not the way it's panning out. I should also add that I manage a library on behalf of the government, and we're finding the same thing in our, our projections. We will be around in 20 to 30 years, and there will be a lot of books, so we can't necessarily achieve a lot of space gains from the lack thereof. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Wyatt, do you have any initial comments? No, I, I think that um, at this point we are looking for the, for council feedback. I think it might be useful, though, to maybe hear a little bit more from the consultants about that question, because I know it's been discussed with council about the future of libraries, what e-books, uh, what that means for space needs, and, and how that analysis was done, and, and, and what you're what you're seeing. Well, uh, Chris Allen. Yeah, it's there. There it is. Um, I've been doing this for 40 years. Uh, I've been a practicing librarian. I've been a full-time consultant. I've consulted with about 350 libraries in 46 of the 50 states. I've planned about 20 million square feet of library buildings. Uh, I cannot name you one library anywhere in the world that is planning a smaller building than the one they have now. Libraries are getting bigger. If for no other reason, then there's more of us, and there's going to be an increasing number of us, and more and more people are using the library. Your library is used 10 times every minute that it's open. It is a very busy library. A lot of that use is by books. Books are going to be with us forever. We've got books that are 400 years old that are just as valid and just as readable today as they were made when they were made 400 years ago. How many of you have technologies that you bought five years ago that you can't use now? Uh, technologies change rapidly. Uh, anything that I say now will be out of date by tomorrow morning's newspaper uh, in the technology world. But the books are permanent. They're the absolute best way to store and house and preserve information. 
Will there be ebooks? Absolutely, there'll be a lot more ebooks. Will there be downloadable materials? Absolutely, there'll be a lot of downloadable materials. You won't have any DVDs that you know today in your library in five years. You won't have any books on CD in five years. That'll all be downloadable and or streaming video. But you'll still have books. But most importantly, you will have more people coming into the library. We project that your total contacts in 20 years will be almost equal to 2 million a year. Now, that's a lot of folks making contact with the library in an area population that we're projecting of about 35,000 registered patrons. You have demographically the perfect library location for high use of the library. You've got high educational attainment level, you've got high home ownership levels, and you've got a lot of children living at home and those things will continue, and those things together mean only one thing, and that is that the public library will use, be used more tomorrow than it was used yesterday, and that increase will only use. And when you finish this project that we're embarked upon with you, your increase will probably go up a minimum of 50% the first full year that you're in the new space, and then it will continue to increase. So don't let anybody tell you and don't believe yourself that well technology is going to do away with libraries because it's just not so. Fifteen years ago we were predicted the paperless society. And do you think technology has made us a paperless society? We're cutting down more trees now than we ever have in the past because all we do is we just print out paper. So the libraries <coughs> are going to be here and you're making some really important decisions, not only for today, but more importantly, for the future of Falls Church. Because the Falls Church Library, the Mary Riley Stiles Public Library, reaches more people than any other part of city government or any other element in this city. And most importantly, and I'll shut up about this after this, it reaches that group of young children ages zero to five, and that is the critical age for development. If we don't get them on the right track, and the public library is where that track can start, if by the age of six they haven't man managed things well, then their future is not very bright. And if we don't do that for the entire country, our future as a country is not very bright. Thank you very much. Um, are there some questions from council members? Does anybody want to start? Dave. Thank you. I appreciate all your good work. Um, I know I met with you guys. It's been a little while now, but uh, it was very good to meet with all of you. Our library is cl critically, uh, our library is really a civic gem, and it's critical that we maintain and enhance it. Um, I'm wondering, do you have a recommendation you know, from this right here? I know we've got the options in front of us, but are you at the point where you can give us a recommendation as to what you would uh, propose? Yes, I believe the recommendation is that the library should grow in its current location through some horizontal expansion. And again, I think I pointed out two uh, options for that horizontal expansion. We're exploring some others, and I think the final report will uh, show some variation of a horizontal expansion. Uh, and right now, it seems... Uh, uh, attainable that that horizontal expansion can be done on the library's existing property. Uh, but we're still exploring options on that. Uh, the horizontal expansion, uh, one of the two of the several options we're looking at are on, is on page 10 and page 13. So the options, the, the two that you're proposing essentially would expand the footprint, take up the parking that's at the rear of the library and expand the footprint to basically fill up the entire property and then put the parking on a separate parcel. Is that generally what your options propose? Generally, yes. Okay. And um, you mentioned the storm sewer line. I presume, Wyatt, that's a city storm sewer line. Is it not? It is. And so um, one thing that I think we can follow up on is you know, that's, that easement serves an adjacent property. And so that stormwater needs to go somewhere, and it needs to go by gravity. So it is, it's a, 
hard object to move. Is it um, is that the only solution? I think there may be some engineering solutions that we haven't fully vetted yet. I would suggest that you not take it off the table and say, well, we can't do it because since the city is the grantee on the easement, presumably as long as an engineering solution can be worked out, um, we would be willing to relocate the easement or do something uh, to take account for that. Um, let me ask you, have you had any discussions with the neighboring property owner? It looks like a lot of your proposals show a parking deck on the rear of the, the neighboring parcel. Any discussions at all with them? Uh, no, we have not. I think that's part of what Mary is referring to with, with getting the blessing we, to. Yeah, we'd like to have some kind of um, okay from you all before we do anything like that. And let me ask you, it looks like, I mean, just my own sort of anecdotal experience walking by there a fair amount, <coughs> that that lot during your peak times is fairly empty and during their peak times, probably not your peak times. I'm wondering if some kind of parking sharing uh, could actually work without building the full capacity of both places. In other words, you know, on Saturday afternoon, there's probably nobody in that lot, but that's probably a fairly busy time for the library, I'm guessing, or Saturday morning, and uh, in the evenings and things like that. So I'm wondering if really the full park out to the maximum of each use is probably not, in, uh, it's not efficient and probably um, is maybe wasteful, and so I would just sort of suggest looking at that to the extent that uh, you're able to. Sure. Um, uh, let's see. Two, but I want to just leave it at that for now as far as questions, comments. Thanks a lot, Dave. Who's next? Anybody? Yeah, Myra. Thank you. I also would like to uh, thank all of you for the work that you've done and for the members who've come in to listen uh, to the presentation. I also had the opportunity to meet with the consultants in uh, June and had a, a very uh, complete discussion on that. I was very pleased. Uh, I certainly fully support the concept of an expansion of the library, and the wrap seems to be uh, the most logical way to go. And I would like to emphasize uh, something, and as a parenthesis, I do not believe I have a reputation of being particularly sentimental uh, on I financial no. issues. <laughs> <laughs> but let me say something that borders on the sentimental, which is, from my experience, it is so unusual to have a city hall, a park, and a library located together. And I think that's something that we should cherish. If I may be a little dramatic, if we lose the, the continuity and the placement of the, any one of these three components, I'm concerned, in my view, that there will be very little social glue that keeps Falls Church together as a city. We've been involved in a number of major development projects, more will be coming down. There's a lot of transformation and transition that's taking place in the city. Uh, but this, this is something that is central to Falls Church, has been central to Falls Church, and is something that should remain, certainly in my view, central to Falls Church. And this is uh, a great idea to take advantage of what we have, grow into the needs that we are occurring, and move forward. On the parking, uh, just some idle thinking. Uh, as as since it was in here, perhaps if you actually got a couple hundred space in a structured parking, maybe there could be use it, you know part for the other people that want to come downtown. Maybe for maybe I don't know if City Hall could use some of that terms of whether it relates to what the city's requirements are and affect the needs of City Hall parking expansion. But it seems like a great opportunity to take advantage of this moment and see if we couldn't get a, a couple hundred extra parking <coughs> spaces. Uh, I even have an idea how it might be financed, but I'll spare you that, uh, that comment right now. Uh, as such, I think this is an exciting opportunity and I'm you know, strongly support your efforts in this regard. If I may just uh, just follow up with both of your comments on parking, just to reiterate for clarification, we understand as a consulting team that our uh, charge within the proposal was to simply give a recommendation on the number of spaces that we would recommend for the library, and that's what we'll do in the report. And I also do not want to imply by virtue of the studies in, in the report that those we think that those are the only two ways to solve that parking problem necessarily. 
and we certainly wouldn't recommend a parking solution certainly on someone else's property if it wasn't a win-win situation so we understand that's getting to the outer limits of what we've been asked to do and i don't anticipate we'll take that farther but we just want to put it out there for conversation thank you bill <coughs> excuse me i'm not sure i understood what you said compared to what he asked uh, I think Mr. Kalin's idea to somehow synergize the needs of the city in terms of parking and uh, meeting space and so forth um, with the library are very important. This is a great opportunity to do that. So, but at the same time, of course, we're not going to ask you to do something that's beyond the scope of your work. I, I guess to go to what Mr. Tartar said, w what are we being asked to do with this information? Or are we, are we, as Mary says, supposed to uh, now go to the owner of the office building next door and begin talking with them about parking? I mean, the one thing that seems clear in the study, and thank you also for giving me a chance to meet with the consultants, uh, the one thing that seems clear in the study is everybody likes the building where it is, and the parking is wholly inadequate, right? They love it where it is, and the number one complaint is parking. So we're not going to do anything unless we address parking i mean when we do something let me express it positively when we do something we're going to address parking as part of that so uh, is, is your study going to like end where it is now or, or uh, are we going to go beyond that with you all to try to look at pictures of what parking would look like if if we were able to incorporate this lot next door and 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 or the lot as the manager says behind which it appears from what he says we may in fact you may you may be able to include that in your thinking well in terms of the report the report is going to expand on what you see before you uh, in terms of recommendations of our analysis on how a building can grow. We're going to give you a more detailed enumeration or a program of what should be in that 33,000 square feet of the new building. Uh, we're going to come back with some recommendations on some of the operational and functional aspects of the library that our consulting team has been working on. So the, the, the final report is going to have a lot more than just uh, how should the building be expanded and where should the parking go. But we were asked to, to give you in the report a recommendation on the needs for parking. Everyone knows there's a need. Everyone knows that there's not enough spaces. But I think people have asked us in the report to say, well, how much, how many spaces do we need? How much parking is needed? So we're going to give you that. We believe that number is about that 130 number. Um, what we did is we decided to take it upon ourselves to look at what we considered maybe the low-hanging fruit options because they're right next door. There's not a lot of available property adjacent to the library, but this piece seemed to have an opportunity to solve that parking problem. But what I'm saying is, is I'm, I'm not presuming that this is the only solution that's out there. And I think to analyze other solutions out there I think are beyond the scope of our work. Okay. All right. Well, then let me ask the second question, which is to draw on your experience, all of your experience, and designing libraries in a lot of different settings, urban, suburban, rural maybe even. Um, could you, would it be part of the scope of your survey, of your study, uh, your work, to draw us a picture of a 33,000 square foot library built from scratch uh, with the appropriate amount of parking, uh, you know, agnostic as to the meets and bounds of, of the locations that we're working with here, just to give us some idea of what an ideal library would look like and would be parked like so that we could assess if it in any way matches up with some of our other municipal facility needs, uh, city hall or schools. I mean, is it possible for you to just show us a library that's got the square footage that you recommend with the recommended amount of parking uh, on a reasonable property size and then, you know, just leave that at our doorstop and let us we mull over that? We could we could probably give you a verbal description of the, the amount of acreage that might be required for a typical library of X size and the number of parking spaces. But even that um, is, is somewhat um, arbitrary in the sense that we have to assume is it a one story, 30,000 square foot building? Is it two? Is the slight, you know, site sloped? Is it flat? Is it not? So um, you know, I in some ways it's hard to really give you a definitive answer on what the, the requirement would be without some criteria for what's available. I mean, every site, every building, every parking layout is really custom customized to a particular site. 
And uh, but we could probably say, you know, 130 spaces and a 30,000 square foot library should take typically, if it's a one story building, X number of acres. We could we could do that. Okay. All right. So if we could provide you with some information based on small area plan drawings and uh, circulation that the community has at least looked at in a preliminary way, you could make something of that information, perhaps. We could give an opinion. Okay. Thank you. Ron. Well, I, I, I appreciate all the work that went into this, and the, the advice I would give is if, if the committee has some feelings on what should be done, they need to make that clear, because the worst thing you can do is lay out five recommendations to say, council, how do you want us to proceed, because nothing, nothing's ever going to get done, or you end up with something that's very different from what everybody on the committee envisioned, since we weren't sitting there and going through the process. So if, if people feel strongly it should head in a direction, the way to do it is to put it out on the table, advocate for the need, and then we can argue about the money and how it gets done and how long a period of time it takes. The, the other piece of it is I seem to recall we had a bunch of discussions about the expansion of City Hall that involves some parking as well. So you sort of need to not look at it in a vacuum and pull out some of those plans and not forget about some of that work that's already been done as, as well, given the points that were made about the proximity and the sort of campus uh, that we're trying to preserve here. I would mention, <clears throat> excuse me, I would mention that the final report will be given to you on October the 14th. Um, the final study is due on the 30th, but you'll get a, you will get a recommendation on October the 14th. <laughs> this is really to solicit input from you all in terms, and, and let you know where it's going, how it's moving, and as part of the RFP, this was required uh, to give you a chance for input. So. Thank you, Dave. I guess I would say also maybe as part of your report, will you, um, in far, as far as your recommendation go, have a recommendation as to which direction to move? In other words, not just make your building bigger, but go this way versus this way? Yes. Okay, because I think that'll be helpful given that we have several parcels that we might be looking at for expansion purposes. Okay, yes, we'll do that. And also, will there be a recommendation or do you have one now or an estimate of costs for this? You know that's that's that, that's that's the million dollar question, isn't it? <laughs> All the, and probably more than a million dollars. <laughs> In your dreams. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, right now that is a good question, and and in some ways. Um, I think that you're dealing in a, if we're looking at a 33,000 33, square foot building and we're looking at taking uh, all or a portion of your existing building and then adding on to it, I think we're probably somewhere in the 12 to $15 million range total project cost. And that's furniture, technology, fees, moving, uh, all of those kinds of things. But, but in all honesty, for us to hone in in more detail, it's going to really depend on which recommendation we're putting forward. So, but I think it's probably, and that's not including any parking solution. I think that's just isolated to the library property and the, and the library building itself. So the, the estimate you just gave, which I know is rough and subject to change in your final report, um, but that does not include, for example, land acquisition costs for a no. neighboring parcel or for structured parking, the cost of constructing uh, structured parking on a neighboring parcel as well? Correct. It does not. So it's really just the actual footprint of the building itself and nothing the, really beyond it, it's, that. It's the total project cost for the library expansion. So it's that. It's, it's, the, it's the bricks and mortar. And everything it's inside of it. the fees and everything inside of it. But nothing outside of it. Correct. Beyond yeah. the property boundaries, it would not. And again, that's a range. I understand. You know, and depending on how much work we think may or may not have to happen to the existing structure as part of our recommendation, that number could fluctu sure. fluctuate a little bit. I understand. Thank you. Thanks. Um, well, let me, um, let me offer, since this is an, an input stage here, let me offer some questions that I think you're going to get uh, from the community. The first one was that you've got 35,000 users, but the city has 12,000 population. So are we providing a library and spending money for our citizens, or are we doing it for the region? And if so, is the region going to kick in? That would be point number one. I think you're going to get this question, so that's why I'm giving it to you now. Second question is um, the cost issue, and I think we've got a rough idea. Um, we have to keep in mind that our schools want us to build a new high school that's estimated to be $100 million. So I'm going to ask the city's finance officer to do some long-term look at what is our capital expenditure and debt capability going out three, five, ten years, whatever is a reasonable amount. Because we're going to get that question from lots of folks. How are you going to afford this? And it isn't 
just your money or, or my money, it's everybody's money. And so they're gonna treat it that way. Next issue is on parking. Um, when the initial presentation was made, one of the things that was considered desirable about the library is, is that it's walkable, and yet you call for a significantly more parking. There's a disconnect there. If we're providing parking for people who live out of the city, then it's a little bit hard to justify our taxpayers paying for that. So beyond the parking that's there, and you've heard other questions from people about the parking, if we're going to add to parking in any way or put a deck at an additional cost, it seems to me we have to have other justifications for that beyond simply library use. And I think you're going to get that question from lots of folks. Sure. Will it support surrounding commercial areas? Or if it's just for the library, who are we spending this money to park? The um, question I have is the Virginia Room, something near and dear to me. Um, does it call for expansion, improvement? Can it act as the archives for the city? You know, those are sorts of questions that I think you'll get from the historic uh, folks. Um, the notion of city and schools and city library uh, cooperation. One of the issues I think we're gonna hear more and more is we're a small city, two square miles. Why don't we get multiple use out of our buildings? Why are we continuing to keep things separate? And you mentioned that um, offhandedly uh, before. So um, those are questions. I only ask them because I expect that you're going to get those questions. I think they ought to be part of your report. It will make your report stronger. Uh, I have to admit my mother was a professional librarian, so libraries are very, very close to me as a personal matter. I love this one. I want to preserve it and carry it on to the future, and I want it to be a library that will serve the future. So you have my commitment to work with you to have a library that will serve this community uh, for the future. Uh, oh. Mayor Pro Tem, on the first question. Thank you. You just promoted me. <laughs> you're, uh, That's right. <laughs> you're, uh, you're entirely a welcome. real southern gentleman. Yeah. Uh, I, I often go by "Hey, you," so you know that works too. Uh, the first question you ask, we fully anticipate that it, it's a very important question. Uh, the reason we look out 20 years is because it often takes five years to see a project to completion uh, when all things are added up. And if you only plan for 10 years, then you've only got a five-year bill and you've got to start over again. So that's why we look at at least 20 years. But what we will provide for you will be a building that will go well beyond 20 years because most of them do. But you have in this situation, you have a, an agreement of which Falls Church is one of 14 communities, you know better than I, that have reciprocal borrowing. And one thing we heard from many people uh, is that they are library shoppers. And there are a lot of shoppers in Falls Church who go to Arlington County libraries and Fairfax County libraries. But there is apparently a greater number of people who come to Falls Church because the projected registered patron figure by the year 2033 will be about 35,000. The projected population of Falls Church, to the best of my ability, looking at three different sources, would be about 15 or 16,000. So if we planned a building for only the city of Falls Church population, but continued, you continued in the reciprocal borrowing agreement, you would be too small the day you open the new building. It would be crowded beyond belief because those people would not stop coming to use it. So your only alternative, in my judgment, and I've dealt with this many times around the country, is you have to stop the non-resident from using the library unless they wanted to pay a fee of somewhere in the neighborhood of 250 to 300 dollars per year would be about the going rate for that kind of a, a situation, which would also immediately result in all probability in Falls Church residents being unable to go to any of the other library. Now that's clearly an option that you have, and if you only plan for the city of Falls Church, we can reduce this building size by about 8,000 square feet. And, and let me have a smaller collection. And let me so interject on, so on that point. Let me interject on that point to say, in response uh, to your five questions, that um, 
just as you've committed to work with us, I will commit that we will answer all of these in detail in the report. And, and just to follow up on that, I don't think that we're recommending that that be the solution or the way we approach it, but it does, it will be part of the written explanation for, for the usage numbers that we're projecting. Thank you very much. One, one other question you're going to get is a lot of folks here work in law firms and other offices where, in fact, at least the organization I work with eliminated its library. So a lot of you're going to run into a lot of folks who work in the private sector where libraries have been regularly eliminated. So it's important to make the case to them. I mean, this is clearly a different situation, but to illustrate it and demonstrate it will be important. Can I go back to the Virginia Room question a minute? Can you tell me a little bit about what the plans would be for the Virginia Room? The plans are to continue it uh, and to make it uh, uh, better. Uh, we project, and this is something we've asked staff this morning to really look at and help us with, we project a very modest increase in the monographic uh, collections, but uh, if you marketed that room and had a, uh, a perhaps somewhat nicer, more uh, aesthetically appraising space, uh, you might attract some real other collections that would be very valuable. It seems to us as your consultants that uh, the library is the very best source to collect and preserve uh, this, the history of the of the community because if the library doesn't do it, it's very unlikely that anybody else uh, will or would have the resources to do it. So we see the Virginia Room as a very important part of the library, not necessarily a lot bigger, but a very important part of the library. Other questions from council members? Comments? Yes, Laura. Thank you. A uh, very useful series of uh, discussion right now. A uh, comment uh, as to a drawing of what a new library would look like. Obviously, <coughs> Mr. Duncan would like that. That's fine. Uh, it's not something that I'm particularly interested in. Uh, I really would like simply that we stay with the location where it is. So that data might be useful for others, but certainly not in my decision-making process for what that's worth. Dave asked to the cost. I actually did an estimate of what the tax rate would be under a series of assumptions and he was published uh, if we assume that the hundred million dollars were to go forward as placed in the CIP made certain assumptions about uh, administrative cost growth in the city and the school system uh, we the estimate that uh, Johan and I came up with that in uh, as it's headed right now if we don't get additional economic growth and especially Speaking for myself, again, we can't speak for the council, uh, what happens with the property uses at uh, George Mason. Uh, by 2018, the tax rate here would be $1.90. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, Bill, did you have a question? Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so next steps are um, you're going to take this back, you're going to work on the questions from the board, from the community that you've heard tonight, and you'll bring us a report sometime in October. Is that right? That's correct. We're going to move forward and assemble a, a, a rough draft of the final report over the next two to three weeks, and we'll assemble that in September and have something for your review, um, as you said, in October. Okay. Anyone from the library board have anything else? Brad, you want to say anything else? Okay. Thank you very, very much. Great presentation. We wish you well and we'll look forward to the report. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is the Miller House property briefing. Council, uh, we are joined uh, by our Director of Human Services, Nancy Vincent, and, um, and a team that has, uh, uh, part of a team that's been uh, looking at the future use of the Miller House. And we wanted to come to you tonight to um, discuss the future of the house, see what 
what uh, what the council's thoughts are on how this property uh, could be used in the future. We have come forward with a recommendation that's in keeping with its historical use as a um, as a group home for adults with disabilities, um, and some ideas on how that could could be implemented. But let me um, ask Ms. Vincent to introduce her team and then uh, the process that they went through and um, and a discussion of the property. Thank you, Wyatt. Uh, with me here today is Dave Rogers. With me here today is Dave Rogers, who has served the city for many, many years on the Human Services Advisory Council, and uh, Jeannie Cummins Eisenhower, who is the Investment and Development Manager for the Fairfax Falls Church Community Services Board. And uh, I want to just describe to you a little bit about um, our decision making process, what we went through, what this, why this came up, and then to get your overall uh, thoughts about pot potential disposition of that property. Uh, the, uh, the Miller House property is located at 366 North Washington between Sunrise and Christ Crossman Church. It's um, a property that's been there for, for many years but has been vacant for the past, oh, since 2008, for the past about five years, and it had been used as a uh, group home in the past. Uh, it is 7,500, the, the lot is 7,500 square feet and has an assessed land value of $451,000. It's zoned T1, which is by right uses for things such as a uh, uh, parking lot, office building, daycare center, group home, bed and breakfast, uh, those kinds of uses. The city's building official and uh, Parks and, or not Parks, uh, Department of Public Works staff went out to the property to look at the structure and uh, th that includes Bill Hicks, and the recommendation from that group was that the um, structure be raised, that the um, th what is needed to repair the structure is, is really not worth the cost. Um, it would be over $150,000 to repair the structure. So, so that was the initial recommendation. Uh, after that, uh, White asked that we put together a focus group to kind of look at the property and to make a recommendation about a potential use for the property. And uh, the focus group, it was the, the list of uh, attendees is in the, <coughs> in the memo that we submitted and that, uh, in that included um, the church, the Christ Mon Crossman Church, the uh, church across the street, uh, the Habitat for Humanity, developer, uh, the Human Services Advisory Council, Planning Commission, and Wendy, I think, is here. She served on the, on the group from the Planning Commission, staff from Parks and Rec, um, Planning, Human Services, <coughs> Community Services, uh, Community Services Board. And there was also uh, input from, and uh, information went out to Sunrise, to the shelter folks, um, to the Disability Services Board, and to, um, home stretch. And so what the group did is we had to first determine what, what kind of need was there in the city. And Jeannie gave an excellent presentation about the, uh, the need for, uh, for housing for folks with uh, disabilities. Now, uh, we did not invite, um, did not include uh, economic development or um, people from the chamber. And, but I have uh, spoken with economic development staff and there is a commercial viability to the property. So if that's the direction you want to head, we can look at that as well. And that would be for uh, a law office or um, dental, dental office, that, that kind of a use. Um, the group that was there did, did after um, discussion and, and a couple of meetings and hearing about the need, uh, come to the conclusion that, that a, um, Housing for for adults with disabilities would be um, the best use for the property. It's an excellent location. It's on the bus line. It's close to the metro. Um, there's um, avid support from the from the church next door and from the church across the street to uh, provide support to um, to those folks um, that that um, could be served there. 
And so uh, the recommendation put, put forth that I would like to get just kind of your feedback to see if we should pursue it further would be to, um, to look at it as a, as a possible use for adults with disabilities. If you think it should be something else, then let me know that as well, and we'll kind of steer in, in that direction. And um, I'd like to uh, allow uh, Mr. Rogers to make any to make a comment as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, as you may know, HSAC has been following the Miller House for really years and years and years, and um, we've been involved every time there's a been a decision point regarding the use of this um, uh, the structure of this facility. And uh, essentially, right now. Uh, it has been vacant for about five years, and it's in such a grave state of disrepair that it really isn't of any use to anyone at this point, and probably, um, you know, should should be demolished if nothing else. But um, we've been following this proposal that's come forward, and, and think that um, there really is an opportunity here to provide housing for persons with intellectual disabilities. The uh, institutional. Uh, group that's looking at this uh, is very interested and they're very strong and they are the serious um, seriously trying to find solutions for uh, their own community and this is the Christ Bossman Church and the Columbia Baptist and uh, also sort of parenthetically HSAC in the past has looked at the issue of housing for persons with intellectual disabilities and um, we weren't very successful in the past uh, in trying to find ways to incorporate housing solutions for this particular group of persons within other new developments or finding other group homes. And in fact, the trend has been that we've lost ground on that front uh, in general. So anyway, um, it's a good proposal. I can't say it's, uh, if, not, if, if not the best proposal so far. And as we'll hear in a moment, there is a diminishing supply of these services in the region uh, for persons with intellectual disability. And if anything, the demand for uh, this is constant, if not growing. And um, I'm not the person to give that data, but I think we'll be able to find it and bring that forward in, in due course. But what really uh, attracts me to this and why I'm here is because there is this um, small group of institutions and, and interested individuals, and I think that um, it's worth giving them the opportunity to see if, if they can come forward with a um, specific proposal. Uh, another strength is that there seems to be resources for the long-term operational financing to ensure continuity, and I think that's really uh, the big question in my mind as we look at any project is how to make sure that um, whatever we put into place uh, can last for 20 or 30 years because the fundamental assumption is that the um, persons will age in place. Uh, so anyway, uh, HSAC endorses this project uh, to provide uh, housing for um, very ambulatory um, persons, persons with intellectual disabilities um, based on the limited information we have so far. But uh, we would recommend that um, if council finds this of interest that uh, we be given the green light to pursue this further. And uh, I think that the fundamental uh, request in a final project would be utilization of that uh, land uh, to build a facility. And um, there would obviously be some financial costs along with uh, demolition and, and um, constructing a new building, but uh, we're not that far along yet to have any concrete statements on that. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, uh, Jeannie is here as, as the expert uh, to, and is available to answer any questions that you may have about uh, housing or, or individuals with intellectual disability, um, disabilities generally, the need in the, uh, in the area uh, for that service. So I would like to open up for questions and. Any questions from council? Bill? Thank you. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to hear about this at the HSAC meeting that I went to. Uh, my understanding is that this population that we're wanting to help um, 
the reason that the need to help has become more pressing is because of the regional sort of approach that we have used up to now in larger facilities is being abandoned. And so basically communities are being asked to pick up where the region has dropped off. Is, is that kind of what's going on? That's, that's, a, that's a bit of it. Um, the, there, the state, uh, the Commonwealth actually signed a settlement agreement with the Department of Justice mm -hmm. um, around uh, a couple of different elements that, was, that were basically related to um, the Olmstead decision and the Americans with Disabilities Act. And what the uh, settlement agreement talked about was really two, two distinct populations. There's the population of individuals who currently reside in training centers throughout the state. And um, the fact that, and the, and the settlement agreement basically acknowledged that the Commonwealth has not been doing enough, fast enough, to be able to start working toward helping uh, create a conduit for those individuals to be able to get services in their home communities. Um, uh, based on what, what the Americans with Disabilities Act says about where people should have the opportunity to be able to receive services mm -hmm. in the most integrated environment appropriate to their needs. Okay. So that was one, that's one part of it. And the Commonwealth has basically chosen to uh, comply with the settlement agreement by working toward the closure in a systematic manner of these training centers over time. Um, and uh, so we have a training center up here uh, in Fairfax County, the Northern Virginia Training Center, that is scheduled to close in June 2015. Mm -hmm. The other part of that settlement agreement focuses on the fact that we have incredibly long waiting lists for people who currently live in the community but without the services that they need to live safely and healthy and, and uh, actively in the community. So many, we have uh, waiting lists in Fairfax County, including our citizens in Falls Church, um, of, of over uh, 500 people with intellectual disabilities, many of whom, the majority of whom right now are in what we call urgent situations because they're living with aging caregivers, caregivers who are no longer able to meet their basic uh, behavioral or medical or physical, physical safety needs. Um, and so we have to uh, we have to be able to uh, work on ca providing care to those individuals in a timely manner. And so far, the state has not been able to do that in a timely manner. So the settlement agreement also says the state needs to start working toward creating the community uh, service system that is uh, adequate and appropriate to be able to meet those individuals' needs. So we basically have pressures coming from two different directions, people coming out of training centers back into their home communities. And people who have been in their home communities for all, since they were born, but have never really had the adequate appropriate services that they need to be able to thrive in their communities, or, or sometimes not even just thrive, but be, mm -hmm. be, be, be safe in their own communities. Okay, thank you. That's, so that's very, very helpful. If I could, just two other quick questions. My understanding is the population that would be served at a facility like this is not a population that's going to need to have parking. They're not, by and large, going to be driving cars. No. So are the constraints on the size of the facility that you show, which is, I think, two stories, are those related to, and I think there's five parking places shown, are the constraints related to the parking that can be provided? I mean, could the facility be bigger um, if parking for staff could be provided somehow by, as you noted, the churches involved who are pitching in on this in a big way. I mean, could we have a three or four story building, assuming it could be financed and afforded, if we could provide parking for staff uh, that was nearby, if not right at this location? That, that would depend on exactly how, what staffing ratio needed to be for, for individuals who were living in, uh, in, in the units. Um, but it could certainly be explored. I don't see why it couldn't be explored. All right, well just and there's the, the, the zoning, and we'd have to look at the zoning and yeah. the constraints around zoning. Well, okay, those are, those are questions that I would just like to put out there. And, you know, if the size of the facility generally is constrained by parking needs here in Falls Church, everything we do, but this may be an exception to that, particularly if parking for staff could be provided at nearby institutions that are <laughs> basically cooperating. Uh, the third point is uh, my cousin back in Knoxville is uh, – 
uh, executive director of the Sertoma organization, and, and I know a little bit about what she does there. But one of the things they do is provide housing for some of the people who work in the sheltered workshops that they have. Uh, she's had some success getting the private sector to pro bono donate certain construction uh, services, uh, demolition, some construction, and so forth. I would just ask if that's legal possible uh, certainly would encourage that if if that's an avenue that we could explore here because it would enable us to make whatever dollars we have go further thank you thank you Ira. that's that's bill no i know but <laughs> uh, you had your hand up yeah. as well thank you uh i'm not quite ready to go as far as mr duncan is in terms of how you should proceed in checking things out i have a couple of questions uh, how many, what, with the two stories, how many uh, residents did you believe you would be housing uh, with this, if this were to go forward? How many would be, how many beneficiaries would there be? Well, it would, be, it would depend on the population. Um, I think, how many were, were we talking about? Twelve? It, uh, yeah, eight, eight, somewhere between eight and twelve. Okay. <clears throat> now this would be for, uh, this a regional agreement or this just before Frost Church citizens? Um, my, my sense is, is that you would need to have a regional approach and, and the reason partly is because of funding for supportive services. As we were talking about just a moment ago, the way that uh, the, the funding will come about uh, is based on the urgency of need. And so people get taken off of the wait list based upon their current uh, situation in terms of urgency of need. And, and we, the CSB, at least, when we, we make those determinations, we don't necessarily make a determination based on jurisdiction. So the issue would be if, if uh, an individual were at the top of that waiting list and they were taken off of the waiting list, there'd be no way to guarantee where exactly they're going to be from. They're going to be from the Fairfax Falls Church <coughs> area because that's who the Community Services Board serves. Um, but we can't choose one jurisdiction necessarily over no, I'm, I'm another. just trying to find out. Uh, uh, no, sure, but that's, you know, that's sort of the way it would work. So it would be regional in that, in that sense. And the city, the city contracts with the CSB so that um, city residents are, are um, served through this, uh, this mechanism. Right. But certainly if there were individuals that are currently served in our system who, pref who are Falls Church residents who would prefer to live maybe closer to their families in Falls Church or something like that, there may be opportunities for people to move from maybe where they are closer back home or things like that. Uh, Dave, you see, how you doing by the way? <laughs> <laughs> we used to work together. Uh, you said there's long-term financing available for this? This is what I understand, that with the closure of the training facilities, and I believe, I believe so, and um, my understanding is that with the closing of the training facilities, there will be resources that previously were destined to the persons there made available in the new facilities. Uh, but all of this needs to be worked out, and I think the, the idea of, of this, this get-together today is just to get a thumbs up or a thumbs down, and if we do get a thumbs up, then we'll uh, certainly go forward and get specific answers to the, those kinds of questions. Actually, without sort of a cost idea and what Falls Church's potential obligation would be, it's difficult to really speak to it. Uh, I've been mentioning for years that we could look forward to it. Unfortunately, I think the projections have been pretty accurate that as the federal government cuts back, the states cut back, and then what's left over gets dumped on the municipalities. So we're getting all you know for the schools for the interjurisdictional you know for the judicial support for fire for police everything is getting more expensive because the other sources have cut back and if it's relying on the state of virginia to provide the resources as they filter down through these closures i think that's a pretty risky bet because virginia is not well what is demonstrated is we'll do whatever it can to avoid a tax rate increase or to hide a tax rate increase. And for, I don't know what the per capita costs are going to be, but they're going to be substantial for, for these individuals. 
uh, the funding is going to end up problematical and it's another open expenditure for the city then to potentially absorb so I, I can't really say to go forward because I don't have any idea of what the city's financial exposure is going to be thank you thank you Dave uh, uh, yeah just a couple questions so thank you all for being here um, one, uh, just so I can understand a little bit better, you mentioned mental disabilities. Is that people with maybe Down syndrome, or what? Could you explain a little bit more what um, what that means? Sure. Um, so the, the the community services board serves several populations. We serve people who have intellectual disabilities, which would include people who have Down syndrome, um, uh, people who have a basically an IQ that is at or below seventy, and also have some significant um, deficits in, in different kinds of adaptive functioning. Um, uh, we also serve people who have um, mental illness and we have serve people who have substance use disorders. I think the focus here tonight was really on, on the, the, first, the, the first group of people um, and that's who we would sort of market, market the, the initiative to. Okay, so this houses for the first group? That's who we would, that's who we would be marketing to. Okay. And, uh, Secondly, it sounded like, uh, just so I can understand a little better, the city owns the property, they owns the land, we own the house, we're talking about demoing the house, and then the idea is that we would lease it to maybe some third party group, like some kind of nonprofit group who would then operate the facility. Is that sort of how it might work or what you're proposing? Sure, and, and, and the other, you, you could either ground lease it or you could actually have, uh, you could ground lease it and then, and then allow the nonprofit to uh, do the, the construction and, and the operation of the facility, and that would actually come back to your question, and because the nonprofit will have access to certain funding and financing sources that um, other entities might not have access to, you know, whether it's foundation financing sources or um, Virginia Housing Development Authority, different kinds of entities like that. So it'll have a, a better ability to leverage financing sources. So, but you're not proposing any one particular option, such as we're proposing that we'll lease it to a third party nonprofit. You're just saying, because it seems like, to Ira's point, that there's different costs to the city. For example, the city were to own and operate it. In other words, build a facility and then operate it on an ongoing basis. There'd be different costs to the city versus a ground lease to a third party nonprofit. Right. Is your proposal any one of those, or is it just kind of open that, you know, we'll try to figure it out later on, or what is your proposal? Let me try to speak to that. Uh, and again, we haven't gotten that far because I think the, the main question is, c c should we really seriously consider uh, ac having access, or can the city provide access to this property? And if the answer to that is yes, then I think the idea is to go forward and come up with some kind of public-private right. partnership that uh, would definitely limit the city's long-term exposure. And so there may be some upfront investment costs and of course providing uh, the, the, the property, the land, into perpetuity, I guess. But um, uh, I think that a reasonable proposal would be to address your point, and I'm very um, aware and, and sensitive to it, that the long-term operational responsibility would have to be uh, borne by the, the operators, and uh, it could be a, this consortium of churches or uh, an NGO or someone, and we don't really know exactly who that would be yet, but uh, because this demand exists and because there is a potential for private funding, e even um, uh, uh, the estates of the parents of the people could provide resources, there are uh, a lot of other small funds, there may be a way to put together a package that would uh, provide the resources necessary to operate this in, all, in the long run without creating an open-ended liability for the city. And I think that's, that, that should really be our uh, marching orders for going forward. Right, we're, when, um, we're not proposing that the city, <coughs> excuse me, that the city construct and operate this facility in, in any way. Um, the, pr the procedure would be to issue not an RFP but a we were, we were looking at the option of even potentially doing a PPEA, a Public Private Education Act proposal, so we could actually solicit proposals, more open-ended proposals from nonprofits uh, and other entities, basically saying we have this resource, we're looking for partners who would have uh, the ability to create this kind of 
project for this pop, you know, targeted to this population, bring us your proposal and show us how you're going to leverage your resources and then see what we get. And then whatever rises to the top, we can actually look at and start doing some, some, some work with. Uh, but that would give us the ability to see who's out there that wants to do something, that knows how to be able to leverage the resources from the system um, and knows how to work with a resource that's actually given them to given to them or or or, or late least to them in some mechanism um, to be able to maximize its utility uh, and 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 show us the their ability to be able to make sure that they're going to be able to operate the thing uh, and and not have to come back to the city for something later on down the line. So that would be that would be one approach to being able to. Uh, get input from the outside and see who's out there that can actually, could actually take that on. Um, so let me ask you, the building itself, if you were to observe current zoning requirements, could your footprint get much bigger or is the footprint pretty near what your building would have to be to meet the current parking and landscaping, that sort of requirements? The, the renderings that you have here were done by the uh, planning office. And so just looking at zoning, I, I believe it can get, it can get bigger. There, ha, there, there is certain setback requirements. I think it's 25 feet in the front and 30 feet in the back. Um, so within all of that, it, it, it can be bigger than the current house that's sitting there. I mean, it looks like the current house is like a four bedroom house or something. But I mean, I imagine, um, what are the, the uh, ratios from occupants to caregivers? I mean, is it fairly high, like one-to-one, -one, or what would be the, the ratio typically of uh, residents to caregivers? It, it's going to completely depend on the individual's needs. So you may have, it, it, you may have one individual who needs, you know, almost one-to-one 24-7, -one but you may have somebody else who doesn't, who, who could use drop-in. So it, it, it it's going to be done on an individual by individual basis. So there's no state requirements or guidelines for a facility of this sort. No, because you'd really be the way that the way that this is the way that this is actually configured. You actually have individual units within this. The individual self-sufficient units, like yeah. their own kitchen. Oh, so it's not kind of like a group house in the sense that it'd be shared facilities, but you would have a, a composite of a bunch of different units, like maybe right. five units or something like that, or six units. And then you'd have like an on-site kind of manager sort of person? Right. I see. Okay, thank you for the information. I appreciate it. Thank you. Other questions? I mean, it, it sounds like all we've got sort of is a general concept, but in, until we get a specific plan, I don't think you're going to get much reaction pro or con. There's not much you can say. I think everybody agrees with the need, and we understand how it's a regional shared both obligation and benefit to the community, but the question is going to be what kind of specific plan do you have and whether it's workable or not and without seeing that. I don't think anybody's, I don't think you're going to hear a major objection absent are we picking up an unreasonable share of the regional part of it. We may be about to hear a major yeah. objection. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I mean, that, that's a, a minor objection. But yeah, I mean, it's not object, no, put it this way. It's very, it's very nice to hear that there are. I want the sensitive Ira to come back. <laughs> I've, ex I've, I've used up that, that tank is empty. You know, I got to refill it now. Uh, what I what would be difficult is, I at the end of the day, first of all, the, the lease will be a dollar a year, so there's no forget, forget making any money on the lease. I mean, that's that's got to be that. Otherwise, it's not going to make any sense. So there's no there's a, that's just. If there's an opportunity cost, so be it. My the wor real worry is that these, if the private funding is interrupted, it will not be possible to kick eight or twelve people out into the street, and the city will get the request to fund the program or to start to fund the program, because the, the headline risk or the reputation risk is so severe, you know kicking people out who are in, you know, uh, in, in this type of need. So the issue is, I mean, this is the financing has to be absolutely ironclad, maybe a trust set up for this where the fun, funds are put in and whatever, however they manage the trust, the income off of that supports it, but something 
because otherwise the exposure to the city, no matter how well intentioned, and I'm sure and they, everybody could pass a lie detector test when they sign it that they're going to do it. It doesn't mean that their fund won't disappear, have another problem, suffer its own fraud, or just have crummy returns or whatever the case may be. And this is a situation where I don't think the city wants to be in where it says, okay, you know, they're gone and we're just going to let them walk into the street. We'll put pressure on the city to, to cover that. So we have to find out absolutely how ironclad that funding will be. Well, one of the, one of the good side effects of this Department of Justice settlement agreement is the fact that the state is being required to actually start putting funding for the services component, not necessarily for the housing component yet, but for the services, the long-term supportive services component into place. So we're starting to see through the General Assembly commitments for these Medicaid home and community-based services waivers coming on a more regular routine basis than we ever have over the history of, of, of the program. I understand, but this is but this is funding that's backed by a settlement agreement, which could take the state back into court. So, so that would that would some people don't mind, <laughs> but that's 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 a start. So now the biggest the big the big gap that that needs to be backed up by what you're saying really ha is more within the the housing operations realm. Um, and if if we can get that piece together, then we probably have a package that's workable. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Sorry, wasn't a big disagreement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, um, As a member of the group, could I come? Sure. Let me come on up. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. As a member of that committee that was studying this, it was a uh, very interesting. A group of people and a couple things that I just want to reiterate is the fact that this is uh, not only community driven but also by the churches across the street and the church uh, right Christ Crossman and they were very very involved in every single meeting um, the the whole idea that sunrise is right there also might uh, bring about some uh, jobs for these people it's on uh, the bus line for anything else. And then some other things that came along is the fact that Christ Crossman, I know this may sound like a little thing, but uh, it's kind of big. They have a community garden there. And uh, th so they take all their vegetables down to the, uh, to the uh, what, DC Ki Central Kitchen or someplace. Uh, all the time and is run by volunteers from the church. So there's a lot of opportunity for interaction, which doesn't come about in any other area. And, uh, you know, it's just the perfect, absolute perfect location. And uh, that home was last used as a refuge for, uh, I think, women in distress with families. And there was some stuff good, but it's never would be enough, not good enough for, I mean, not accessible enough for uh, anybody with uh, intellectual disabilities. Also the fact that, as you were saying, Phil, is that um, the, the lay of the land has a, sl a definite slope. slope and there could be some more access to uh, you know, a larger building and everything. And the other thing I wanna say is we've had a couple developers sitting in with us all the time and there might be a, uh, case for public-private partnership, people who really, really want to do something like this for a community. And I think that, uh, you know, it's a group of people that are not served, and they're, they're getting less service. Okay, I know, I already going to get all upset with me. I'm getting confused with the information. I got the impression that this was going to be, the operator would be entirely private through charities, whatnot. Right. So what's the public part? Well, th what I meant was a developer coming in and building it. Thank you okay. very much, Lindy. Appreciate it. Um, two questions I have that are fundamental questions before I'm ready to commit. The first is, is this the best way to serve this population? 
and what is the population with regard to the city of Falls Church? And secondly, are there alternative uses for this site that would generate more money for the city that would allow us to provide these services more cost effectively? Um, so those are two fundamental questions I have that, that will, um, that I think, again, will be asked by people when we, when we make this decision uh, one way or the other on this. I certainly don't rule out your proposal, and thank you very much for working hard on it. Um, the question is, um, are we ready to go with a piece of this, demolition of the, um, of the house, or uh, more discussion? It's up to what people want, uh, what, what people want to do. Any thoughts? I wouldn't dem demolish uh, an existing structure without knowing what we're going to do on okay. site. I mean, it just seems to me that okay. uh, I'm certainly open to hearing more as we discussed tonight about yeah. what are the options, but I don't think I'd go and demolish a house uh, in the meantime. Okay. You, you did see the pictures of it. I understand, yeah. but I mean, I, I just, unless it's, there's some reason that it's eminently going to collapse, it just seems to me that, you know, if, a hundred, if for example, $150,000 fixing this thing up, I don't know how that ratio comes to about versus building a brand new building and it probably is the better thing to build a brand new building but I guess until we know what's proposed I'm not sure we can make that determination at this point is my two cents okay I'm not hearing any sentiment then for any particular action tonight but uh, interest appreciation for the work that's been done so far some questions to allow us to make the decision in the future um, anything else from council can I just to address, sure, absolutely. Just, um, just really quickly, uh, just to, re to read off of um, uh, Bill Hicks' uh, report about the property is that there's, just for your information, um, broken internal sanitary, potential overall structural integrity issues resulting from the addition between two upstairs dormers, entire heating system failures, water damage to multiple walls with suspected associated mold, Dominion service binding up between chimney and tree, and no ADA compliance. So we will, um, I think one thing just we wanted to make sure the council was aware of what was going on, the, th the thinking that was going on in touch base before we proceeded too far down a path. Uh, we've got questions from council. Uh, we'll get responses back. Um, but the, um, is there a consensus on council for us to flesh out the idea of the PPEA from a financial perspective just so we understand what the possibilities are um, <coughs> to um, to get a little bit more clarity in terms of what the city's um, contribution to something like that would be and answer those types of questions. I think the only way to get those answers would be to go down that road further um, on, on the PPEA concept. Uh, thanks. <coughs> uh, by the way, $150,000 doesn't sound that much for a total rehabilitation, so that's why I, I would say wait before you demolish it. That's that's really, you can have a kitchen and another room done and practically run it back. Uh, the PPA, whatever you described it uh, from, but I'm, I need to reiterate that expectations have to be extremely well founded. Why do, would you believe what specifically would we receive or the private company, what would it be and how ironclad would the financing be? Because there's a terrific exposure to the city if promises are made, expenditures are incurred, and then the funding becomes irregular or ceases. This is a very big deal because the per capita costs. We just had, I hate, I mean, just to compare, we we're talking about a 10, 12 million for a library expansion, but that doesn't serve 15,000 people in the city. So the per capita cost isn't, everybody's eligible for it. These are very specific mm -hmm. subgroups and their needs are very specific. And unfortunately in our society, it costs a lot of money to take. So you're devoting a lot of resources and a lot of energy for a relatively smaller number, not denying their need. So that's why we have to make sure that if it's going to be done, that the private sector will pick up the costs for this. Mr. Snyder. Thank you, Ira. Or not private sector, the non nonprofit sector. Bill. Thank you. Uh, the answer to your question is yes. I would like that information. Uh, I mean, I think that our understanding of what the alternatives are is what we have to have before we can begin to address the concerns that Mr. Kalen expresses. So, yes, I would like 
to see us devote effort and energy to this just as much as to the library question. I mean, to me, tonight's agenda includes, you know, two things that are very much a part of the DNA of the city. You know, we, we try to meet people's needs. And this population has needs that are considerable and expensive. Uh, the library is also a considerable expense, and I would like to see just as much effort expended in this area as in the area we talked about earlier. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Um, well, let, let me try and summarize. I, I think you, you, you can pursue fleshing out what a, a use as you propose, how you would fund that. I don't think, at least from my standpoint, that I'm willing to say that's the only use for this property at this point. I would like to see, because on Saturday the EDA talked about land banking for economic development purposes. I do want to assure myself that this is in fact the best use of that property for the city in terms of providing the services that we're talking about and, and just generally for the city. So I would like a little more there but I don't hear any disagreement with your, uh, with the notion of fleshing out the option that you've been talking about tonight. Any disagreement there at all? Okay. Can I just comment to that? Sure. Um, I, I agree completely, and I think that the city does need to optimize the uh, parcel of land, and it does have multiple uses uh, beyond this, but I don't believe it's the scope of this particular group right. to actually address that. So. Um, you know, we would have to have that uh, conversation with um, whomever is responsible <coughs> for looking at the other uh, economic. Yeah, and and we would do that with uh, with Jim Snyder and, yeah. and economic development, and, um, and and we'll get back on that Be because it's adjacency of Sunrise and the church property. Mm -hmm. It has not stood out as a consolidation opportunity. Right. And um, but let's we we will. Um, we understand that that needs to be part of the evaluation before, before moving forward. I, I, again, you, you bet we'll get this question from lots of folks. Yeah. So, Yeah, I think it is, too. I'm pretty familiar with it. So, Anyway, any other questions at all, um, comments from council? Uh, listen, thank you all very, very much for the work that you've done. Much appreciated and look forward to continuing to work with you. Take care. Right, nice to see thank you. you. I know. Where have you been? <laughs> 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 okay, the next item on the agenda is a closed session um, upon a motion made by Council Member Pepe and seconded by Council Member Kalen and passed by a voice vote of City Council. A council went into closed session pursuant to Virginia Code 2.2-3711A7 for, uh, quote, consultation with legal counsel and briefings by staff members or consultants pertaining to actual or probable litigation where such consultation or briefing in open meeting would adversely affect the negotiating or litigating posture of the public body, specifically NVTA bond validation suit. Um, Vice Mayor Snyder, yes. Uh, council Member Duncan? Yes. Council Member Kalen? Yes. Council Member Pepe? Yes. Council Member Tarter? Okay, we're in closed session now. Let's take a um, five minute break. Protect the city's interest in the case of Northern Virginia Transportation Authority, the statutory dependents at all, case number 2013-11988, including intervening in the case according to the terms and conditions discussed in the closed session. Vice Mayor Snyder, I'll be pleased to do the real call vote for you. Mr. Kalen? Yes. Mr. Pepe? Yes. Mr. Tarter? Yes. Mr. Duncan? Yes. Vice Mayor Snyder? Yes. Thank you. Passes unanimously. Next slide on the city. All right. So you have in your packet a highlight of the request for this evening, and attached to it was the June 13th memo prepared by Paul to give you a uh, refresher. Um, so I'd like to just do a highlight this evening, and then Paul and I will be glad to answer any questions. The request for you this evening is to establish a special transportation fund, which is called for from the state code, and it is critical 
uh, requirement to allow us to access the 30 percent funding um, that is uh, for the city specific ability to determine its usage the other part of this request will be to transfer funds into it so it is a fully funded live account this is helps to um, further the um, documentation of the value and the impact to the city <coughs> based on the validation motion that you just um, acted on we would have our 70 percent projects and this would also say we're pursuing the 30 percent benefit that the state code affords us the um, tonight we are not asking for council to do a budget amendment on the expenditures or to identify which projects we would spend money on for two reasons one MVTA and the localities are not going to expend any money until we get through the bond validation suit because we don't want to be in the petition position of whether it has to be refunded by us or the state we're just not going to have that risk we'll have the court action first and two uh, with Paul's assistance and Jim Snyder and um, Kirsten Munz from Public Works and myself we're going to build some proposed transportation plans and CIP projects that we would have public input in both residents and the business community take it through the formal CIP process so that Council and the Planning Commission formally act on it and that would be part of the expenditure so tonight the request is to establish the transportation fund which needs to be a standalone accounting enterprise fund and to transfer funding the fund is one of the requirements to access our 30 percent money and the other is to actually have money that we are committing to transportation as sort of a leverage or a match to access the 30 percent the 30 percent funding as we noted will be determined by the city council how we expend it it's calculated on um, commercial and industrial tax which we've talked about in the past we have the ability to do the transportation overlay from the original transportation bill that was about the only thing that survived the Supreme Court but we never implemented it because we hadn't developed the transportation project plan and council in the community was focused on stormwater and that had an extra utility fee and so we didn't over impose that on the last two but as part of this bill being adopted we were able to negotiate it that it could be the commercial industrial overlay or the equivalent and so what staff is proposing council to consider this evening is to fund this transportation fund with the or equivalent it will solve the issue for FY 14 in that you have put 800,000 into the CIP for a revenue sharing transportation grant that is new money past post the uh, maintenance of effort period of FY 13 so we can count it as new money towards that 30 percent drawdown and you will see on um, lines 80 to 88 of the staff report we speak to the fact that the CNI would in City of Falls Church generate just under 900,000 um, putting that 800,000 towards this uh, 30 percent um, it looks like we're still confirming some fine-tuning numbers um, but around 800,000 is what we can get of the MVTA 30 percent um, because we're not asking you to fund the full amount that MVTA has estimated our revenues to be it's pro rata adjusted and so that's why it's a little under the dollar amounts that you see here we are only proposing moving this 800,000 roadbed uh, reconstruction or revenue sharing money over because it's very concise it's very easy to account as things sort out by definitions on whether you can use operating money staff money everything else we're not touching that I will uh, do want to give council a heads up that we are looking at whether for example the 50,000 that councils already committed for the Easter seals project for sidewalks and roadway could count towards that if we could roll that in then we could get a little bit more of the share <coughs> basically break even um, so by the time you see this on Monday there might be some slight changes to the numbers but the uh, they will be minor in terms of the change that you see presented here this evening um, I do want to highlight um, that this answers how do we get the 30% money for FY 14 
as part of the FY15 budget and doing CIP, we'd have to re-ask that question because there is, if there's not additional money put into the CIP, local money, whether it's pay-as-you-go or debt, we won't be able to a access this because this is an ongoing funding source, which other localities have done. They've done it as a CNI or a um, Alexandria does it as a um, penny on their real estate. So that is just a, that'll be a long-term question that you'll see coming back, as well as um, what projects to fund with this approximate 800,000 that we've been able to draw down from the 30 percent, which. Um, as Mr. Snyder has noted earlier, our citizens will be paying, and if we don't access this 30%, it will roll into the 70% and go somewhere in the region. Uh, so with that, the NBTA team that's gathered before you this evening is glad to answer any questions, and we would ask that next Monday you schedule first reading the public hearing and uh, move this for second reading September 9th. It is an ordinance. And so it does require two readings. Yeah, just, just to reiterate, there are two ways that a community could be eligible for the 30% money. The one is to levy a new, a new tax, a special <coughs> tax, and that would be levied on our businesses, which are largely small businesses. So far, they've shown very little enthusiasm for that. And that would be a decision we would have to make, you know, based upon whatever input we wanted. The second ap approach is, or the equivalent, and in last year's budget, we committed an equivalent money for transportation. So this action would allow that money to be considered so that we can leverage the additional $800,000 that otherwise would end up in the regional pot and we, we would not have control over it. So that's pretty much what the action is. That deals with 2014, 2015. There needs to be a lot of work and a proposal to, to you all as to how to um, best proceed. But this captures. Um, effectively $800,000 that we wouldn't otherwise have without this action. So with that, we're glad to uh, answer any questions and uh, seek Council's input whether to proceed on next Monday's Council Action Meeting. Uh, just a technical question, Mr. Fur, $800,000, would not that be small for a bond issue or would it be part of something some other issue we would make because 800,000 seems like a terribly if, small if we were going to bond it it would be part of a bigger bond issue of but it would specify that particular project okay thanks any other questions <coughs> yeah. just oh. generally we do ask questions about the long term implications but everybody feels okay that you know, the arrangement that Mr. Snyder's explained for 2014 does or does not set any particular precedent. I mean, the budget for 2015 is a blank slate. We start over, everybody's okay with that. I mean, we're not, like, getting started on something that we can't change our minds on or a future council. Okay. Okay, all right, just want to make sure. And I would concur with that, but you will also, just as we would talk about how much you would lose on the 70% if the suit's not validated, you will, if we don't go past FY14, you will lose somewhere around 800000 every year thereafter. Ira? Yeah, I, yeah I, I understand that's a very reasonable question. I, I think we're, if I understand correctly, we're going to have to put money in anyway, if I understand correctly. Now the question is, can we access or not so... You know, for this, how much is the ante to play in the game? And this is, this is what's required. Uh, but otherwise, it's what we were going to get just goes to the 70%. So not we're sure. not in a great, it's just not a great position, but that's the way it is. Yeah, separate from this funding source, there are unmet transportation infrastructure needs in the city. So you will be seeing requests from the CIP. And so it's just a matter of whether we're leveraging a dollar for dollar the way the state structured it as a match, but it's actually just our way to get our 30%. And, and I personally want to see how would these expenditures can assist our economic development uh, targets and otherwise work on that. I mean, they need to be transportation related, but one smart expenditure would be how they also support 
And we talked about it in the June 13th, but the 30 percent the city has a lot more control over how it's spent. It's not just on capital that benefits the region. So this pot of money actually gives you all more decision making as long as it's within the state code definition of transportation. Which okay. shouldn't be too difficult. I mean, for instance, tonight's discussion about the library makes it very <laughs> clear that much of the traffic that comes in our library is coming to us from the region. So anything we would do transportation related on most of the things that we are talking about even City Hall where you have you know DMV and court and so forth you've got people coming from all over the region so we should have a pretty strong case to make I uh, I made the comment at one of these meetings if you don't think we're regional we'll just put a barricade across Route 7 and see whether that has a regional impact or not I suspect it might So just, just a quick question. So in reading this, it sort of it seems like the state legislature, the state code requires us to kick in kind of $800,000. Explain to me again how it is we're kind of doing the math or the bookkeeping to show that we're kicking in $800,000. The We have to show we are committing, we being the city and city council, to transportation, but that transportation money doesn't have to um, be paired with the new 30% money. So in essence, we are benefiting twice from council's approval of 800,000 for another revenue sharing roadbed reconstruction project. It's new past, there's a maintenance of effort up to FY13. This 800,000 is new. So you get credit for it to draw down the other 800,000, but it doesn't mean you have to do 800,000 to that revenue sharing and another 800,000 to the 30. So you're getting credit for it. Is this the one on West Street? Is that what you're talking about, the roadbed? Yes. So, but to each year we have to come up with $800,000, kind of a new transportation spending to match the $800,000 we want to get. You have this. a choice. You can project by project, year by year, try to match money, and it's pro rata. So if you don't hit I got you. that, I got or you. council can determine a dedicated funding source that goes into this transportation fund and the projects are built against the available funding. I got you. So, but um, in the past, have we spent 800 grand a year on other things that would qualify as a routine matter, or is it some years we do, no. some years we don't? More like that. And so yeah. how much on the years we don't do we not spend? We relied mostly on kindness of strangers. On state money, state, so state and federal grants. Do those count, or those wouldn't count? No. So, so this count. would be new local money for transportation. I got you, but so like just to take me back the fast five years. One year we spent zero, maybe one year of our own. You know, one year we spent five hundred thousand of federal money, and uh, in general, how much do we spend of our own in any given year? Just in general, of our own. Well, that's that qualifies towards this eight hundred thousand we'd have to do in the future. Um, if it's capital, uh, the numbers essentially zero. If it's operating, it would just be our staff. Uh, support for site pl for for administering this st the state and federal grant funded projects and then other transportation work. Does that count the the fund? The staff? The, no, we actually it wouldn't count because it's already in the budget. It has to be new money. But so for next year, for 2016, would we be able to count the staff people who look over these transportation projects? Not unless you, you can't appropriate a new st staff person. So it'd have to be a new staff person. So in the future, going down the pike, if this law is held to be valid, it's validated. Uh, we are going to have to come up with 800 grand in spending a year or lose $800,000 of regional money we've already put in the kitty. Exactly. So we are going to have to either do some good math somewhere like this or come up with, you know, two, three cents on the tax rate and new transportation spending. Or, or simply um, not go back and, and ask for that 30% again. Those would but be the choices we're losing, that are available. We're losing real money, though, then, right? I mean, it's well, kind of like we get, well, we get double money. Well, but here's your decision right now. Do you want to lose it this year? I got that. Okay. I got that. I understand this in, year. I'm trying to figure future. out next year or the yeah. year that's, after that's that. What we're the have, will be. We are going to have this same discussion when we sit down to do the 2015 or fiscal year 15 budget. I, I got you. But and to every year thereafter. But this, to me, begs planning and having to plan so we don't every year come exactly. out and say, what are we going to well, do this year? We're going to do that year. That's Jeez, exactly the, the point. Money. And so I, think, I think the intention is not to just keep having the same conversation. It's, it's to, for next year, to come up with a plan, a permanent sustainable plan. plan. Some of this will have sorted itself out on the front on the state mm -hmm. and what's allowed and what's not allowed from the advisory order that was issued. 
This is, I think based on this is what we need now to get it. I, I got you, it. and I'm supportive of that. But I guess to me, I was thinking a little bit farther down the pike, just so I can understand yeah, yeah, what we need to do down. We're just, we're just not going to resolve that tonight. Well, I know we're not, but I, I guess to me, the thing that I would like to resolve is to do some planning. For example, the PED plan. But, there, is, but that's the plan. The plan is that's what we're going to do. Everybody's committed to that. Right. I so know everybody's committed to that. I haven't heard it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, that is why I asked. Uh, yeah. Dave asks it more and granularly, but you know that is we basically are creating. You know, we created a stormwater improvement uh, uh, set aside, and now we're creating a transportation kind of the expectation of a transportation set aside. And we'll talk about it every year at budget time and how much are we going to fund it. Difference is, if we don't fund it, then we lose nine hundred thousand dollars. So I got that, but to me, it's not just about funding it, but actually having something that we. A long-term vision. Right. Of how well, when we, I say fund, I mean as a city right, we're going to have to have a plan. Achieve that through this vehicle because it's a good vehicle, yeah, I think, but to achieve. The reason it hasn't been, when you ask about does it happen every year, it's been a casualty of the funding, not a casualty of the need. You know, so I mean, like the, needs is, are, the needs are there. Well, exactly. the, yes, the reason I ask it though is not because of that, but we may have to come up with some new money. In other words, if if our budget's been running the past whatever years and not really spending any, we may need to raise taxes a couple cents to pay for this so we can well, get the I money out. You're, you're either going to dedicate a tax or you're going to do the CNI. Which is what the state is pushing. The state is pushing right. a dedicated tax. That's what everybody thinks is going to happen. Yeah. And most localities in Northern Virginia have done the <coughs> CNI, <coughs> but Loudoun and Alexandra, yeah, and us. Um, and there's pros and cons, and it really is a focus on the business or the community as a whole. Staff has already started to work, and Paul's the lead on the expenditure transportation plan for FY15 to 19 CIP, but also included, will that be the next five year cycle in a long range? So in essence, you have a transportation plan like the watershed management plan. And so you can look at what are you buying? I mean, every year we know we have the opportunity to go for revenue sharing with VDOT money. That's a one-to-one -one match. So if we do that and you fund the match, then we can automatically draw down the 30%. But to your point, it makes sense to know what our plan is and our strategy. We have quite a few grants like the RSDP, which we can get every year to do PED plan. It's lovely, there's no match requirements, so it can fund the project. So we want you to see the projects and the multiple funding sources to see what we're leveraging. Well, I um, guess and you'll see that during the budget process. I mean, I would encourage staff to actually not just be, well, we're gonna need a ro new roadbed, but actually as a grand plan for the city. You know, with economic development, these kind of improvements we're talking about now can really work together to foster economic development, to improve sidewalks in commercial areas. You know, things like that. It's not just let's re you know let's put a new app, uh, layer of gravel and sand underneath the roadbed, but it's let's create a walkable downtown that feeds and promotes economic development. I think planning needs to be a critical You're part. Speaking our language. The, the planning department needs to be a critical part, not just transportation department in this. I mean, it's a great opportunity, I well, think. Well, to be clear, you do not have a transportation department. What you have is a team that's the transportation from planner and the transportation engineering from public works, so by default. And then we have Rick at the, Rick at the table. Like you will get Jim the big Jim Snyder point. at the table would be great, too. Yeah, we, we uh, have them at our monthly CIP meetings as well. Uh, I still like my uh, movable uh, walkway, by the way. Uh, don't don't write that off so far. Uh, I'm calling it the honor Kayla movable walkway. Um, Memorial. If I, <laughs> if I could understand, just make sure. Have we seen a cut in federal state grants or matching grants of uh, 800000 or more? Have, have they taken money? Is that is that dried up or are we getting the same amount that we have historically from uh, you mean like the RSTP and the CMAC? Well, money words, I'm trying to figure out is are, are we getting is this another way to 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 screw you know the cities? It's G rated. In other words, if I cut, <laughs> huh? G rated pork session. Yeah. <laughs> My understanding is that <laughs> the, the whole purpose of the bill was to establish a sustainable transportation plan. Mm -hmm. And it is an increase from past funding. Now, there was a period. What do you mean increase from, I mean, total? Yes, statewide total increase of transportation funding. Statewide, and then you have new money for Northern Virginia and Hampton Roads that didn't exist before. Now, if you go back to the recession period and three years back, <coughs> we were seeing major drops in VDOT money, so we haven't recouped that. 
But if you look at the safety loop federal money, that's still there right now, at least through 2018, and RSTP. So those are staying stable. So right now, if you just look two years back, this is new transportation funding. As long as for the 30%, we leverage it. Are we going to be affected by the, if the sequester continues? Is that federal money going to dry up? <coughs> I think, yeah. We're, we don't know what will happen to MAP 21 and the reauthorization of the federal transportation bills yet. That's but, a but risk. But just for context, we get $300,000 a year of federal funding and the oh. 300000 And the um, bill that we're talking about right now, the 70% is about $2 million yeah. per year. Um, so there's significant new money for transportation. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So I, I just, I, I'm trying my own patience, but I just want to end where I started, which is to say I just want to make sure that everyone understands that we are, with our action tonight, at least as far as I would see it, not putting a nose under the tent of imposing a property tax on commercial and industrial property that is, you know, the other mechanism for funding all these important good long-term planning things that we need to do. Council in the future might decide to do that, but what we do tonight does not prejudge that in any way. Is that right? Okay. That's right. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? And then are people agreeable to having this on the agenda for Monday night? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Um, now we're um, have worked our way down to the last item on the agenda and um, schedule questions comments anything tonight around the fringes but also requests from the community to, to have the ped plan um, come back uh, to council for for further discussion so I wanted to just put that out for the council uh, while you have your schedules before you and, and see if there's interest in, in scheduling that and Paul has put together a, a road map on how we can re-engage with the public, but also how we can um, take the plan, um, I think address some of the current concerns that the council had and was hearing from the community and then bring, uh, bring the, the package forward. You would say road map for a plan? I did. <laughs> we could say a bike uh, plan for a... Uh, okay. the, uh, I think we do think that the earliest that we could bring it back um, would be in the October time frame, mainly because the planning staff is heavily engaged in the site plans for the Tenor Hill and um, Harris Teeter projects, along with er a lot of, and, and in VTA. So um, we'd like some time to be able to bring it back. So what you're going to, hopefully what you're going to bring back is really a, a set of projects and a timeline and we're going to avoid the controversies that tied up this plan. In other words, if you bring this plan back, it's just going to trigger the same thing and nothing's going to get done. We all want stuff to get done to m make the community more bikeable and more walkable. And that doesn't mean that every street's got to have a sidewalk on each side, right? I mean, it, it means we're going to do what we can. We're, we're, going, to <clears throat> we're going to improve the sidewalk where it needs it. We're going to be... Um, a, striping for bicycle riding we're going to be doing the things that we can move forward on effectively with community support right okay that's right recently uh, we've been seeing an uptick in the number of requests for traffic calming uh, uh, traffic calming cases coming in uh, and uh, that's building some institutional knowledge in terms of what is there an appetite for in terms of uh, making a street more bicycle and pedestrian friendly um, uh, so that's giving us some sort of grounding. And also, uh, I was here last summer uh, for a portion of the discussions uh, to see what was the strong neighborhood reaction to certain things. And so there are ways to uh, remove those things from the plan uh, and keep intact those things that were uh, favorable to the community. Okay, <coughs> thank you. Uh, 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 so, uh, hold on, <laughs> hold on. <laughs> You're, you're talking October to talk about the PED plan. That would be the soonest. Okay, this this particular council member thinks that the month of October in the city of Falls Church should be devoted to almost nothing except community education surrounding the importance of the water referendum issue. 
and anything that detracts or distracts from that in any way um, is unwise. And so um, if the election is November the 5th, I think, I, I would strongly encourage that the PED plan be an item that we would take up after that, perhaps at November 12th or November 19th, 18th. Um, just based on what we learned in the past um, and what Mr. Snyder said about sensitivities about, that's just what my personal opinion is. Okay, well, we can have more discussions. We talk about the schedule. I think the big question is, what do you bring forward? You bring forward you know, things that the people will agree with and we can move forward on rapidly and start to improve things. I think that's the key. And if it's another debate, there are controversial items in there, there are more issues like that, then it becomes another matter on timing, it seems to me. And if I could, when we've talked about this in the past, I've continued to tell people, perhaps inaccurately, that the Northwest Street uh, project that we stood out on people's front yards and talked about at some length and that there seemed to be pretty good general buy-in for uh, was a sort of demonstration project about what, you know, the new and improved and awesome PED plan was going to be. And it's been always my thinking that if we could successfully deploy something on Northwest Street first uh, so people could see what we're doing and that, you know, the world goes on that it would encourage a better attitude about the whole PED plan. And so is the Northwest Street thing parking along or? It is parking along. The, um, and that, what you just described, has been our, our, our plan, our marching orders. But I've just been hearing persistent requests from individual council members that um, we accelerate the PED plan. Um, so we could go back to that original plan if that's the desire of council. Um, what I think we could do is take that that project is in uh, we're on the verge of going back to the neighborhood with preliminary engineering and so we will be re-engaging with them um, on design options um, and so we, we and, and that's exactly right we want this to be a successful engagement process that ends up with a result that doesn't have the street at war with neighbor against neighbor, but instead working towards a, a good improvement on, on safety and a, a, and a street that works well for the neighborhood as well as uh, for the, the whole city. Um, and I think basically the combination of those two comments does point us to November, and I think that will, uh, or late November, and I think that will work well. If Thank you, and I trust the mayor and the vice mayor and their sensitivities on this issue. You'll, you'll all come to the right conclusion, I'm sure. Thanks. Okay, any other questions, comments about the proposed agenda or I, the schedule moving forward? Is this our oh. last, I think this is the last time you're going on vacation next week, right? I just Let wanted to ask. We, well, we have a regular meeting on Monday, and that's, that's the right. last meeting. Wyatt is going to be on vacation. Cindy's the staff for that. I just wanted before, so this is the last time that this particular group's together. Uh, to ask about uh, the uh, FAQ on the water referendum and the timetable for it. To if, you know, we don't meet again until after uh, Labor Day. So if there's going to be a document available for general distribution in the community for uh, Fall Festival Day, which is September, it's early this year, mm -hmm. it's like the 7th, then it would, it would need to be developed and disseminated basically while we're all gone in August. Is that... Well, we can email it out so council can comment on it, read it, um, and get comments back to me. I think that uh, we will do um, very shortly. And so um, Susan has a draft. It's, it's being reviewed internally right now, but we, we can get that out to council. And just in scheduling terms, uh, were town hall meetings dates set? I was away last week for the the two that were being talked about? Well, let me um, just note, uh, September 8th, I th everyone knows, is the VIPAS um, uh, and League of Women Voters Forum. That's a Sunday. Um, they're, they're the CBC is putting together dates, and I don't have that email right in front of me, but I'll email those out to council. They're uh, putting together two uh, meetings on public meetings on the water sale. And we would propose um, a town hall meeting that would have city officials as well as uh, Fairfax Water officials 
available uh, to present information and answer questions. And I can confirm this by email with you all just to confirm that these dates would work, but we're discussing Saturday, September 28th, and Wednesday, October 16th. Yes. Uh, are we going to run into the same issue if a number of council members show up and it's a council meeting? I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. How are we going to deal right. with that? I got a question on that. Next It'll have to be. Are they going to go? You know, I'm not really sure what the rules are going to be. Well, it'll have we'll to be noticed to the special we'll gathering we'll, uh, of public officials. Once those dates have been confirmed, we can just no notice them uh, legally, and that will take care of that issue. White, I think, as far as I know, the CBC event dates with the Democrats, Republicans at the Legion Hall are September 26th, I think, and then there's another one planned at Creative Cauldron, which I think is October 23rd. But you'll yeah, Wednesday, yeah. Wednesday, October. Right, 23rd. one's a Thursday, one's a Wednesday, and I think it's those are the two dates. But I believe that is correct. Okay, but we'll all check that. Okay, I just wanted to wrap all that up before we go away. Can you send us an email yes. with all these dates? I've been right. trying to follow them and. Just yeah. Um, but but uh, in summary, there's five uh, public fora planned. Yep. Okay. That's the time. Um, anything else? Um, I just want to thank everybody, especially council members and staff that were here, and of course our citizens earlier. You know, a lot of our neighboring jurisdictions are already on break for the summer, and we're still working away on behalf of the public. So, thank you all very very much. Entertain a motion that we adjourn. Move we adjourn. Is there a second? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you.